Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone. This is a new topic. We are going to look at methods of controlling microbial growth. So I'm calling it microbial growth and control. It's divided into two parts and this is lecture number 52 of module 10. We're going to start with a chemostat and batch cultures. How do we grow microbes in the lab? How do we control their growth and what are the major factors that need to be controlled in these cultures? Then we come to heat sterilization and radiation. So these are some of the topics that we're going to cover. Let's start with a simple chemostat. Now a chemostat, unlike a batch culture, is a continuous flowing reactor. So you have an inflow of fresh sterile medium coming in at one end it is completely mixed inside the reactor and you have an output of the media along with the microbial cells that are growing within the chemostat. So therefore it's a continuous open system for growing bacteria. This is generally used in the lab for culturing bacteria on a uh, continuous basis. You can use it for mixed cultures or for pure cultures. You can isolate single species or you can use microbial consortia. Uh, the main things are that it is generally constant volume and you have to provide aeration if you are running it for the growth of aerobic heterotrophic bacteria. The growth rate of the microorganisms can be manipulated by manipulating the flow rate coming into the reactor. So this is the inflow of fresh media and you can regulate the population of cells within the reactor by changing the concentration of the limiting nutrient. And the limiting nutrient in this case in all these derivations that we are going to go through in the next few slides that is shown by the letter S. So S stands for the growth limiting substrate. Before we come to the derivation, let's note a few other points. The growth rate is related to the dilution rate and the growth yield is related to the substrate concentration. So you can control these parameters independently. And what do you need to uh, do that? So you need the dilution rate and the concentration of the substrate. What is the dilution rate? Dilution rate is defined as the flow rate divided by the volume of the reactor or the chemostat. So it can be in liters or it can be in cubic meters. Flow rate is in cubic meters per hour or liters per hour and the detention time can be in minutes or hours. And uh, detention time is the reciprocal of this. So it's volume over flow rate and therefore dilution rate is 1 over theta. Here we have our continuous uh, flow reactor. This is our chemostat. It has an input in terms of media of Q. The substrate concentration is S0. So the initial substrate concentration coming into the reactor or the chemostat is S0. What is happening inside the reactor? There are two things that are happening inside the reactor. One is the growth of biomass and the second is the consumption of the substrate. So V is the volume of the chemostat, X is the concentration of biomass and S is the concentration of substrate. We have a single growth limiting nutrient which is represented by S. What is coming out? For uh, those of you who may be familiar with chemical reaction engineering, in a continuous flow a reactor which is completely mixed. Whatever is inside the reactor is what is coming out. So Q, X and S are exactly what you see inside the reactor. So output is equal to whatever is inside the reactor. It, it may be common sense. So let's just keep it that way. Yeah. 
so s0 is our influence substrate concentration s is our output substrate concentration as well as the substrate concentration inside the reactor same thing for x x is the cell concentration leaving the reactor as well as whatever is inside the reactor dilution rate and detention time have already been defined so let us do a simple mass balance for the biomass as well as the substrate if i do a mass balance for the biomass biomass meaning bacteria so mass coming in let's assume that the bacterial concentration coming in is zero you're inoculating it with a small amount of bacteria and whatever is coming in with the flow is zero mass going out is q by x q times x is the mass of the uh, mass of the bacteria going out of the chemostat what is being produced within the chemostat is mu times x times v mu is the growth rate x is the biomass concentration that's proportionate so whatever is happening inside the reactor is proportionate to the biomass concentration and v is the volume so that is the total mass that is being produced inside the chemostat the volume times dx by dt is you can write it in this way so you have accumulation on the left hand side mass in is zero mass out is qx and whatever is being generated inside the reactor is mu x v this is our first point then we know we know that we are running it at steady state so at steady state dx by dt is equal to zero if dx by dt is equal to zero i can divide this let's do two things first is divide the entire equation by volume and second let's take dx by dt is equal to zero so after dividing it by v we then put a zero on this side and mu x minus q by v x is what we get here and then when that is equal to zero mu is equal to capital D capital D stands for dilution rate let us now look at substrate substrate mass in of the substrate is qs0 mass out is qs how is the substrate being consumed we have already gone through monod kinetics substrate consumed is mu x v divided by y y is yield and that is mu max divided by small k so we've already gone through monod kinetics and we've already seen the derivation for yield uh, so this is um, this can also be expressed in terms of substrate and like i said we've already done this so i won't repeat it here this is equal to k s x v divided by k s capital k s which is the half velocity constant plus the substrate concentration so v times ds by dt is equal to q times s0 minus s minus this entire term and again at steady state we say ds by dt is equal to 0 and you get the final form d times s0 minus s is equal to k times x times s divided by capital K s plus s okay um, that's equal to 0 now there is another term that needs to be included and that is decay so if you want to assume that decay is not important then b is equal to 0 and this is our equation for mu so mu is equal to y k s divided by k s plus s and when you substitute uh, this particular term into our first equation then you get these two terms so you get the equation for d and the equation for s without accounting for decay if you want to account for decay then this equation number three has to be modified b stands for the decay term that's the endogenous decay rate and you can uh, modify equations one and two again similarly to get equation six now if b is equal to zero then x is equal to y times s zero minus s 
and if b is greater than 0 which means you are accounting for decay then you get this form x is equal to y times s0 minus s times the dilution rate divided by dilution rate plus b. Typical values for these con uh, coefficients are noted over here. So you have ks, k, b and y. y can also be determined from the stoichiometry depending on the uh, depending on the nature of the substrate. We come to steady state substrate and biomass concentration versus the dilution rate and d critical means if the substrate concentration coming out of the chemostat is equal to S0. It means nothing is being consumed and that means that all of the biomass is being washed out. So that is D critical and that is what is shown in this graph that this is the dilution rate at which all the biomass will be washed out. So that's a critical point literally and if you do not account for decay then d critical can also be written in these terms so mu max times s0 divided by ks plus s0 so this is the point beyond which you do not want to increase the dilution rate and um, so for a chemostat we do not have recycling so theta c is the solids retention time which is also called the bio you can call it a biomass retention time or you can say mean cell retention time. So if there is no recycle, the mean cell uh, retention time is equal to 1 by d or if you have recycling, then theta c is greater than 1 by d. Theta c is equal to 1 by d and s can be modified from all these equations to derive the last one. All right, let's come to the next point and that is how do we control microbial growth? There are several different methods for controlling microbial growth. We will take a look at all of them. The first one is heat sterilization followed by radiation, filter sterilization and chemical control. Then we have within chemical control, we have antiseptics, we have disinfectants, therapeutic agents, med uh, medicines and so on and growth factor analogs. So let's take a look at some definitions before we go into the methods. So the first one is sterilization. What is sterilization? It's a process that removes, kills or deactivates all life forms. So whenever you go for getting an injection or if you happen to be in hospital for any uh, major surgery or anything minor or major or even a dental procedure, all of the equipment that is used has to be completely sterilized because you don't want to pick up any infections. So using uh, steam under pressure or by using a sterilizing gas like ethylene oxide, you get complete sterilization of whatever materials are being used. Then we come to commercial sterilization. Now food which is packaged is often uh, sterilized on a commercial basis. So you want to destroy all life forms within the food and prior to packaging it. So destruction of all pathogenic and spoilage organisms that grow in food under normal storage and handling conditions is called commercial sterilization. It includes both veget it includes destruction of both vegetative as well as non-vegetative spores and cells. Um, so resistant endospores of thermophilic bacteria may survive but they are unlikely to be present in normal conditions. Under normal conditions you are not going to have thermophilic bacteria but if their spores are there uh, they will also, uh, they may survive under these conditions but they are not likely to be pathogenic. We do not know any examples of thermophilic bacteria that are uh, pathogenic. They will not germinate or grow under normal storage conditions. Then we come to disinfection. Disinfection is very important for us from a water treatment point of view. By now you should be um, clear about the fact that any time you have drinking water that is going to be stored, it should be disinfected. So destruction of vegetative pathogens is the goal of disinfection that is the definition and the goal and we can use physical or chemical methods 
uh, chemical methods are the use of chlorine, the use of ozone. Physical methods will be membrane filtration. That's a simple example of uh, different methods that are used for disinfection. Then we come to antisepsis. Antisepsis is where, let's say, most of us have experienced this when you get a cut or a bruise or some injury, minor injury, what do you do? You reach for an antiseptic solution. So, destruction and inhibition of microorganisms that are likely to grow on living tissue is uh, to be prevented and antisepsis is the way to do that. So, the chemical is almost uh, chemical antimicrobial uh, solutions are generally what is used. Degerming is the physical removal of microorganisms using soap or detergent. Mechanical removal by an alcohol swab is also considered to be degerming. So, anytime you go for an injection or for uh, getting a blood test done, they will always use a alcohol containing swab to clean the area prior to inserting the needle. So, these are examples of uh, degerming. And then we have um, sanitization. We want to ensure that any public places, door handles, desks, uh, all these things, uh, utensils that we use in public uh, areas or even in, at home, uh, you want to ensure that the microbial count on these surfaces is very, very, is as low as possible, close to zero. So we use all kinds of sanitation, uh, sanitization methods uh, there can be several different examples and we will go into the chemical disinfectants that can be used for sanitizing public or private spaces. Um, so high temperature washing is one method and dipping uh, or wiping the surfaces with chemical disinfectants is another method. Um, let me also uh, talk about how we measure uh, the destruction of uh, microbes. So, what you see over here is the reverse of what we saw in the growth uh, lectures and here we are looking at the log reduction in the cell count. Now, one of the parameters that is very common in the literature is either decimal reduction time, how much time does it take to destroy 90 percent of the population. So, that is one parameter. In water treatment, we use another parameter and that is called log reduction. So, I want to know how many logs of cells have been destroyed in a particular process, destroyed or removed in a particular process. So, the rating of a membrane filter, for example, is in terms of 2 log reduction, 3 log reduction, 4 log reduction. These are the ways in which we quantify how many cells are being removed from the uh, water sample or any other sample. Okay? So, what you see over here is a logarithm of the number of microbial survivors and on a log scale, you see the orange line. So, on a log scale, this is log linear, time is in uh, minutes, it is a linear scale and the y axis is a log scale. So, you have a line, straight line. If you were to do it in terms of arithmetic numbers, you would get exponential decay and that is what you see with the green line. Um, in terms of the effect of high or low initial concentrations, now let us say I have two samples. One has 1 million cells or in this case 10 to the power 12 cells per ml and in the second case I have 1 million cells. And I want to know how much time it takes to go uh, to reduce it by one log or th two logs or three logs, whatever it is. So, if we were to look at the one million sample, I am getting six log reduction in three minutes. In the case of the uh, 10 to the power 12 cells per ml or whatever the unit is, it takes how much time to get the same log reduction. So, 6 log reduction from 12 to 6 is again in 3 minutes. So, under the same conditions, temperature conditions, chemical concentration conditions, under the same conditions, the same species should give you the same result. So, regardless of what 
the starting point is, regardless of what the initial population of cells is, whether it's high population load or low population load, in terms of log reduction and the time it takes to get that log reduction, the time should, should be the same. That's the assumption. Then let's come to the effect of temperature. We know that chemical reactions, when you increase the temperature, what will happen? As the temperature increases, the reaction rate increases and therefore the time to achieve the same outcome is going to be less. Okay, So the same thing happens with bacteria. So we have decimal reduction in, um, let's say at 70 degrees centigrade, one log, so from 100 to 10, will happen in 3 minutes. At 60 degrees centigrade, one log removal in 12 minutes and at 50 degrees centigrade, one log removal in 40 minutes. So this is what you are looking at. Now, do all species react to the same disinfectant at the same temperature in the same way? The answer is no. Different species will react in a very different way. So a mesophilic species, the green line is a mesophile, you get one log reduction in 20 seconds at 110 degrees centigrade. It's a mesophilic bacteria. It has no ability to withstand high temperature like 110 degree centigrade. A thermophile, on the other hand, is resistant to, it's fairly resistant to high temperatures. So it takes 10 minutes to get one log reduction at 110 degree centigrade. Then we have hyperthermophilic bacteria. Greater than 100 minutes are required to get one log reduction at 110 degree centigrade. So that's all of it. How do we achieve sterilization, for example? So when we do microbiological experiments in the lab, we need to make sure that all our equipment, our media, our water, everything is fully sterilized. And in general, autoclaving is Autoclaving is a method that we use for sterilizing our equipment and our samples, uh, not samples, but the media and so on. So these are the uh, conditions, 15 PSI atmospheric pressure and a temperature of 121 degrees centigrade is used for standard autoclaving or standard sterilizing procedure. There are several types of autoclaves that are available in the market. This one is a tripod. And you can see it has three feet, it has vents, pressure gauges, a drain for the water and the steam and an upper tap. So this is very common. This is exactly what we have. And there are, uh, so there are uh, horizontal loading autoclaves. You can have room size autoclaves, you can have cabinet sized or refrigerator sized autoclaves. They come from very small um, autoclaves to very large ones. Your pressure cooker is also just like an autoclave. You can use it for sterilizing small amounts of small objects and uh, small uh, amounts of media and so on. So uh, this is a horizontal loading autoclave, which means all the material is put in in the horizontal direction. In the first case, it's a top down loading autoclave. So all types are available in the market. So we're going to look at some of the details regarding how an autoclave works, the principles and uh, you can even see some of the details. I would ask you to refer to figure 7.2 in the textbook. So TFC uh, 2010 edition, it's figure 7.2. So please refer to that for the remaining part. What is the autoclave uh, principle? So here is uh, the lock. This is a horizontal autoclave. Uh, this is horizontal loading autoclave. So you have the, air, uh, not air lock. This is uh, the lid. The lid of the autoclave is a very heavy lid because it has to withstand all that steam pressure that is going to build up over the autoclaving cycle. So this is the door and um, Depending on the size of the autoclave, you will have several safety features that will prevent any escaping of gas uh, steam during the autoclave cycle. So all this material, 
whether it's dry material, whether it's wet material, whether it has caps or no caps, whatever it is, you load it into the autoclave, you seal the door. The door has uh, several features that allow you to seal it safely, just like your pressure cooker. And uh, you set the temperature as well as pressure to the standard conditions, allow the steam to come in, the steam will build up. Now, we normally, uh, an, a very important point in autoclaving is that the entire cycle in practical terms, from the point of closing the door, to the point when it is safe to reopen the door can be anywhere from one and a half hour to three hours or so. Uh, but the actual autoclaving time is actually 15 minutes because it takes a fair amount of time for the steam to build up. You have to maintain the steam and pressure for 15 minutes to ensure that you get complete sterilization of the equipment, both the dry goods and the wet goods. And then it takes, a, like I said, a fair amount of time to bring that high temperature and pressure back to normal room temperature conditions. Only then is it safe to open the door. Otherwise, you can have problems. So there can be accidents, there can be problems if you try to open an autoclave before it has come back to room uh, conditions. So room temperature and pressure conditions. Then let's take a look at another method, which is fairly common, and that is pasteurization. Now, pasteurization is not the same thing as sterilization. In this case, all microbes are not going to be killed. Our objective is to kill only pathogenic microbes. And remember what I said previously as well, and that is that most pathogens are mesophilic species, and these mesophilic bacteria are easily killed once the temperature is taken to higher than 70 degree centigrade. So we have flash pasteurization where the temperature is raised to 71 degree centigrade for just 15 seconds and then allowed to cool rapidly. The benefit of doing this for a very short period of time is that it does not alter the flavor of products like milk and so many other things where you use flash pasteurization. So uh, the benefit of using flash pasteurization is that it does not alter the flavor to the same extent as bulk pasteurization. It kills heat resistant organisms very effectively and it can be done on a continuous flow basis. This is used in large dairy operations and when you have bulk pasteurization, the temperature is raised from 63 to 66 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes and then allowed to cool. So this is done, like I said, again in large operations to uh, pasteurize large, uh, large amounts of material. Um, and that's about it. Uh, so in this particular slide, what, are, what is shown is the difference in decimal reduction time for vegetative cells and spores. So you can see it takes much less time to get one log reduction with vegetative cells and for uh, Clostridium botulinum spores you can see how much longer it takes. So this is generally clear and the same thing for thermophilic uh, spores in this case. Okay. So in the other graph that you see over here one log decrease or one log reduction in the bacterial count was obtained in 12.6 seconds. So this is our one log reduction. So these kinds of logarithmic curves can be uh, obtained and they are generally done in the lab. You subject the sample to different temperatures and measure the concentration of the surviving bacteria. So that is our decimal reduction time which I have already mentioned. That brings me to the end of this lecture. Thank you.